this was about as bizarre and as easy as it gets. So the number for me was a number that would allow me to never have to work. I feel like we got top, top, top. I went from a sale of, you know, $500,000 to in debt. $192 million. This is Built to Sell Radio with your host, John Warlow. Hey there, it's John Warlow. Listen, if you're brand new to Built to Sell Radio, welcome. It's good to have you along for the ride. We've been doing this show now for five years. I've interviewed literally a different entrepreneur every week for the past five years, and I've taken some of their best practices, their their tips and tricks and negotiation hacks, and distilled them all into a field guide. It's a book called The Art of Selling your business. And it is a little bit of a recipe card for you to punch above your weight when it comes to negotiating with an acquirer. You can get it at builttosell.com slash selling. Dr. Jeremy Weiss, welcome. Thank you for doing this. For all of you listening, it is yet another edition of Built to Sell Intel. And I'm along uh, for the ride with my co-host, Dr. Jeremy Weiss. Jeremy, take it away. Thanks for having me. You know, top, top, top. That's all I have to say. Listen to more episodes of the podcast. It's fantastic. And this is where we recap the biggest takeaways from the last month on Built to Sell Radio. And John, you know, John, if people want to hear your thoughts, these episodes are popular because John overlays his thoughts and advice, which I'm excited to hear. He does an amazing job asking questions and listening. But for this episode, we get to hear what he thinks. And if you don't know John, John Worrell is the founder of the Value Builder System and practice management software that helps business advisors automate their processes to win and keep the best clients. The Value Builder System incorporates several diagnostic tools, including the Value Builder Score and is offered by a global network certified Value Builder Advisors. You know, if you don't know the Value Builder Score, you should go on their website and take it. Um, of 90 or greater are worth double the average performing business. So, you know, check it out and take it. You can go to builttosell.com and, and check it out. Um, his best-selling book, Built to Sell, Creating Business Can Thrive Without You, was recognized by both Fortune, Inc. And, and then when I ever hear, Jen, most people have read it that I talk to, entrepreneurs, founders, they want to know um, how they can set up their business, not even if they don't want to sell it, but just so it it thrives, you know? So, Check out episodes of Built to Sell Radio. He wrote the book, The Automatic Customer, as well, creating a subscription business in any industry, and also The Art of Selling Your Business. You know, out of all the advice he's gleaned from his personal experience and his guests, they created winning strategies and the secret hacks for exiting on top. So let's start with, um, there's four interviews from the past month, Justin Adams, Michael Kaplan, Paul Farrell, Michal Sheath. Um, and let's start with Justin Adams for a second. And... Yeah, sure. He co-founded Digitize.ai and to help hospitals get paid. This is interesting because you're like, explain this to me because this there's a lot of you know intricate kind of complicated parts, but they use artificial intelligence to get medical treatments pre-approved by insurance companies, ensuring their patients could pay for their medical bills. And in the beginning, you know, they were hungry for cash, and um, they even had to. Uh, when the clothes dryer broke, they had to hang their laundry outside because they couldn't afford the repair. Um, and ca- he was seeing competitors raising eight and nine figure investment rounds. Um, and so he started partnership conversations and he learned he was maybe worth 15 to 25 times revenue. So he, uh, there's a lot of cool things about this, the hidden downside of retaining at least 50% of your company, how service business are valued, um, you know, why limiting the due diligence period? It's crucial deal point. So, um, John, what did you like about Justin's story? Lots to like. You know, you mentioned it was a complicated business to explain, and I think that's actually an entrepreneurial superpower. If if you can find a way to succinctly describe what you do, I think it makes life a whole lot easier for attracting employees, uh, selling your product, your service, ultimately selling your company, coming up with an analogy or whatever. And so Justin spent a bunch of time doing that. And I think that was great because it's not a very uh, sexy sort of space. He's using, you know, uh, an algorithm to try to figure out whether that patient can pay a hospital bill. Like it's not exactly an easy thing to describe, but he does a great job on the episode of doing that and speaks in lay terms, which is a superpower. You know, I think one of the more interesting 
transferable lessons here for our listeners is around protecting their IP, in particular, if they're going to be doing consulting. So I think a lot of our listeners would aspire to have a product company or maybe a SaaS company, software as a service company, but to pay the bills, they have to offer some sort of service in the short term, right? Which is cash flow positive, which gets them sort of uh, able to, to fund the development of, of another product. Jason Fried is probably the most famous example of someone. He built Basecamp, wonderful, incredible business. But to do that, he got the cash by offering basically web design services. And so he used the money from the web design services to build this company. Justin did something similar from Digitize. In order to build this technology business, he did consulting on the side. And he consulted for the hospitals that he was ultimately selling to. And that can be very, very dangerous territory, obviously, because you're going to then turn around and sell them a product based on work that you did together. And the question then becomes, well, who owns that work? Is it the hospital that hired you and paid you good money as a consultant? Or do you own that work? And I think if you don't clearly spell it out in an agreement that the client signs, most courts, and again, I'm not a lawyer, but a lot of, uh, I think, people would assume that the client owns the work product. And so what Justin did very early on, I think really smartly, was had a lawyer look at his agreement, his consulting agreement, and as he approached hospitals, he never veered off that consulting agreement. Many of them asked for changes, and he was like, no, I, you know, I, I'm not going to change the agreement. And I think nobody actually turned down working with him as a result of him pushing back. But I think he had a lot of foresight in not uh, you know, making clear that he was going to own the IP. You know, the, the famous example, again, probably even more famous than Jason Fried is Bill Gates, right? When he was hired by IBM in the early days, he said, look, I'll build you the code. But at the end of the day, I got to own Windows, right? And, and IBM agreed to that. And therefore, Bill Gates found, got the money to ultimately you know, write the code that became the most successful software product ever in the history of the world. So I think who owns the IP, in particular when you're doing consulting, is a, is a key lesson in this one. You also talked, John, Tim, about, you know, commented how it must be hard to sell into hospitals. Mm, and that, yeah. what I thought was interesting about the conversation you were having with him is he's like, you know, if you show them ROI, it should be a no-brainer. And he was saying, well... Yeah, I could show them, if I show them four times ROI, but they can get 10 times ROI doing something else, well, we'll go with that something else. And I did, it wasn't even my realm of thinking, oh, they had so much opportunity, they have to take the best opportunity. So Yeah, I thought that was really cool because, yeah, everybody knows you got to show an ROI to sell a product and you've got to you know, show the customer that they're going to get a return on their investment. But if, if that ROI pales in comparison to somewhere else, they could spend time. The other sale you've got to make, of course, when you're selling to a big bureaucratic organization like a hospital is you gotta, you gotta make the sale of their time, right? And they have a finite amount of time. If you're the CEO of a major hospital, you have a limited amount of time and you're gonna spend that time where you get the highest ROI. So if your product or service or offering gives them a 4X ROI and there's another one standing right behind it that offers a 7X, despite yours being positive, they're gonna go with the 7X because time's limited. And I think that was a cool, uh, a cool little, tip that came up. The other one that I really like from Justin is he used the old expression, heavy is the head that wears the crown. Mm -hmm. And he used it in the context of, of, of wanting to retain more than 50% ownership of Digitize, right? I was pushing him to try to find out you know, how much of the company he owned. And it was important to him to maintain at least half of the shares. And I asked him kind of why that was important. And he said, you know, it was for control reasons and I wanted to kind of own it. And interestingly, he's now gone on to start another business where he's not the majority shareholder. And I asked him about that and he said, well, you know, being the majority shareholder is great, gives you control. Obviously, it's a great wealth building strategy, but it also can be incredibly lonely and incredibly stressful. And he's actually enjoying his new company more, interestingly, with multiple shareholders because he feels like he's on a team and he's not, while he may be an important member of the team, he's not the only member of the team and he's not the only decision maker. And so he sort of spread some of that psychological weight onto some other shareholders, which he bore most in Digitize, which I thought was a kind of a cool angle as well. 
You know, I just want to encourage everyone, you know, you are listening to, if you're listening to this after the fact, this is a live webinar that you can attend every month and ask questions. So if you have questions, put them in the chat. This is interactive. So please put them in the chat. I'm going to take the first question here, <clears throat> James. So James asks, so why, can you explain why limiting the due diligence or the diligence period is important and how yeah. that affects the deal? Yeah, yeah. Just, Justin talked about uh, the diligence time is one of the standard boilerplate things in a share purchase agreement. In a, in a letter of intent, there's usually a, a, a due diligence period. It's, there's a no shop clause that most people have to sign. Justin had to sign one where you stop negotiating with anybody else for the acquirer, the person you're engaged to but not yet married, to effectively do their due diligence. And usually it's 60 days, could be 30, could be 45, could be as much as 90, but usually it's 60 days. And, and, and as you sign the no shop clause and you enter into that diligence period, every day that goes by, you're losing a little bit of your negotiating leverage because the acquirer knows you're getting more and more married to the idea of selling. You've probably had to tell some of your key employees. You've probably had to tell some of your customers maybe. And again, the more time goes on, the more susceptible you are to retrading as a result of that. So what I think Justin talked about was the importance of really negotiating upfront the duration of the diligence period. Number one, by making that a deal point that you want to negotiate, it makes it clear to the buyer that that's an important piece for you and that you're, you know, you're not prepared to let this drag on for months and months and months. Uh, and number two, it does give you the teeth to then turn around and say, hey, we're at day 45. You've got 15 days to close this thing. Uh, and you've you've had that conversation up front. So I think it's an important, not rather than just acknowledge or sign the 60-day you know, LOI uh, with the 60-day diligence request, I think making it a point, making it a deal point before you sign, I think allows you to amplify its importance in your mind. So I think James Wright, he must have picked up, that was a relatively small piece of the interview, but he must have picked up on that. And I think he's absolutely right to identify that as a major issue. So the next uh, interview is Michael Kaplan, but just uh, one more comment on Justin. Um, you know, I feel like John, there it was entrepreneurial therapy. It was therapy, uh, <laughs> therapeutic for me to. And I don't know if anyone else agrees with this, but um, to hear, you know, he had this really nice company, nice exit, but he was talking about people see that after effect, and he talked about working hundred hour plus weeks, neglecting all other things in his life. And he's like, there is another side to the coin of this journey, you know? So I love how he, he did um, kind of just open up about that a little bit about the, yeah. you know, the hard parts of it. Yeah. And he's got, you know, he's got young kids. Um, his spouse left a really important job to join him in the company and they ultimately you know, as you said in your intro, got to a point where like to fund the business, they'd run out of cash and like literally they started to hang their clothes because they couldn't afford to fix or repair the dryer that, you know, had gone on the fritz. So like it got pretty skinny and that's, that's not the stuff that makes it, you know, into the, into the uh, tech crunch article about, you know, how much they raised or what would the exit They're price not or saying, whatever. Couldn't start dryer, the dryer. <laughs> right, exactly. no it's generally not but i mean it's it's very much the experience for for a lot of entrepreneurs and i think it yeah i i enjoyed that humility that he brought to the interview as well and 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 talked about that it's one of the reasons i'm a big you know there's this age-old debate in entrepreneurship which is should i go to work for a company ford google apple learn all the mistakes on someone else's dime as the saying goes right and then when i'm 35 i'll have lots of business experience maybe a little capital then i'll go start a business or do i you know i'm a babe in the woods do i leave high school university you know and and start a company even though i know nothing have no life experience probably have no money i'm a big believer in the latter i think I think you will learn so much in the first six months of running your own company. Uh, it's when you have unlimited time. It's when you likely have very little in the way of obligations. It's when you can make mistakes, skin your knees, and continue to live on the couch on cheese whiz and 
beer or whatever. <laughs> and guess what? You'll wake up when you're 28, 32. You'll likely have figured it out and have at least a business mm -hmm. that cash flows. Um, but you know, the opposite is not true. I, I, I know very few 35 year olds with two kids at home that want to all of a sudden, you know, put their mortgage at risk and, and start a company. It's just, it's really tough, tough to do it the other way. So I'm a big believer in mm -hmm. getting some, some entrepreneurial experience right out of, you know, out, out of the womb, so to speak, like get out of high school, get out of university and, and, and get some stuff on, under your belt. One concern I would have is, um, kind of a golden handcuff thing. Like you said, if you follow the first scenario, I remember visiting LinkedIn in Chicago and they had like a full level of just, they have a chefs that making breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I'm like, if I started working here, I would never leave. Like, why, why would I ever leave this place? Right. You know? I'd be like 50 pounds heavier and would never, <laughs> ever wait, leave. Start my own thing and go into not eating and, or eating ramen? Like, forget that. I get yeah, my yeah. private chef. So I think there's something to what you say there is not only is there a lot of risk when you have started a family and everything like that, but you're, you know, there's a, um, you're, you're feeling good with where you're There's at. There's a life that you become accustomed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you so. know, you see this a lot with, with, with entrepreneurial bankers, like investment bankers or people in the financial services world. And the income gets so good so quickly that, you know, they take on the trappings of their, you know, the, the car lease, the house, the private schools or whatever. And then it's just, it's impossible to leave all that because the burn rate is just, so significant so yeah so anyways yeah i i uh <clears throat> echo those sentiments um or you could do a little bit of both but uh michael kaplan michael kaplan um is his his this is talk about not sexy business okay he had a carpet and living services <laughs> care franchise business all right so was a if you cleaner. pop like non-sexy businesses out there but it was generating um three hundred thousand dollars in revenue so he bought it and it was generating three hundred thousand revenue but losing forty thousand dollars a year and he figured he'd come create efficiencies build it up and he ended up doing just that the company then um and you know that was in 2006 and 2019 was generating 17 million dollars in revenue um, him and his partner had some differences and you'll talk about that. I thought this was fascinating in, in triggering a shotgun partnership agreement and John will talk about what that is and what happened. Um, but there's, and he talked about a no man's land between startup and mid-sized business, like these awkward years and, um, just the danger of aspiration or core values and a bunch of other things. So uh, where do you, what, what did you find interesting with Michael Kaplan? Yeah. I mean, you know, the shotgun agreement, I find such a fascinating, uh, raw, <laughs> completely, uh, uh, perfect in its own precision and, you know, mercenary accuracy to be a, a really interesting legal mechanism. And so most people listening to this will be awoke, you know, aware of what a shotgun clause is, but effectively, if you and your partner reach a point of irreconcilable differences, you can make an offer to that partner to buy them out at a certain price. And the hitch is that if they would prefer to take you up on your own offer, they have that right to basically buy you out at the same price. And so it, 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 it makes it, it forces you to be honest and fair when you make an offer because you may end up having to accept the same offer. And that's what happened to Michael Kaplan. So he made an offer to buy out his partner and his partner said, eh, no, I'll, I'm going to buy you out for the same price. And it ended up being around four times EBITDA, uh, which again, it isn't a spectacular exit multiple, but neither was the business, you know, didn't have a lot of technology. It wasn't some fancy tech company. It was a it was a carpet cleaning business, right? So it probably was reasonably priced at, at four times EBITDA. And, uh, you know, that's the, 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 the kind of double-edged sword that is a, a shotgun agreement. And, you know, I, I always talk about people who are, are going to go into business together in a partnership. First of all, obviously tread lightly. I mean, it goes without saying there's, 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 a, there's a litany of sort of deals that, that generally fall apart and and partnerships often do and so having this sort of shotgun uh, clause can be a, an important way to make sure you keep each other honest along the way um 
I'm always a big fan of making sure you're at a reasonably similar stages in life. Hmm. And so with the shotgun clause, you remember, like, you mentioned this on the episode, like, was, you know, if someone is significantly better off than the other, they're, yeah. they have some leverage, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So if, if you, you know, if you're some fancy mucky muck and you've got lots of money and you partner with some kid out of school, you are at a huge advantage in a shotgun agreement, right? Because you can basically lowball them and ask you know, to buy them out. And unless you're deal is your your business is bankable, they have to all of a sudden scurry around to try to come up with the same amount of money. And for them, it may be impossible for you. It might be just like stroke of a check. For them, it might be impossible. And so when there's a huge gap between you and your co-founder, if they've had four successful exits and this is going to be your first or whatever, tread lightly because you, you never want to be at that disadvantaged position in a, in a share purchase agreement. Again, this becomes somewhat moot if the business is bankable. Like if you could go to a bank for the money to, to fund it, but if you're, if you can't get a, a bank loan or you don't have enough wealth, you know, built up in your home, or you just simply haven't built that stage and you haven't gotten to the stage in life where you'd have the money to buy somebody out, it, it can put you in a disadvantage in, in this sort of shotgun. So just be tread carefully when, with who your partner is in a shotgun and make sure you're hopefully at a, at a similar stage in life. John, I know, you know, in built to sell and automatic customer, there's a, you know, subscription model built in and, and you look at that as one of the key drivers. Um, you know, in this, he did talk about how <clears throat> they go in and they clean someone's house and they're done. They need to get a new customer. Was there anything that you've seen either in this business or any other service businesses to actually put in some kind of recurring model. Um, I know you've had some HVAC companies on. Um, what have you seen that works in like a service business as putting in a subscription? So you're not just basically waking up another day, okay, I got to eat, so I got to get new customers today. I got to go you know, <laughs> buy, you know, buy the, the paid advertising yeah. on Google to, to try to drive the, the inbound. Yeah, look, I mean, any sort of service business where there's a recurring need for the service, like carpet cleaning, is absolutely ideal for a recurring revenue model. What you're looking for is the is is something that needs to be done on a regular cadence. And cleaning carpets to keep staff healthy, keep you know uh, family members healthy, is important, right? Because there's all kinds of nastiness that gets embedded in a carpet. And I think if you can make that case that look, the health of your family, the health of your employees is paramount. What's one last day of productivity because your employee uh, is is uh, is out sick or God forbid, your, your child is sick and you've got to take a couple of days off work to care for them? Like, what's that worth to you? It's probably many hundreds of dollars, uh, in many cases, many thousands of dollars. And therefore, let us come every six months. And, and one of the things in the automatic customer, we talk about this guy, idea of the simplifier business model and, and a recurring revenue model. And the idea is that like for your customers, we get a bit, que sometimes we get a bit queasy, like, oh, I, you know, I don't want to ask them for a subscription because I feel awkward asking and it's sort of presumptuous or whatever. The inverse is actually true, right? For a lot of your customers, it it is much more preferable for them to buy on a recurring contract effectively, where you say, look, I know clean carpets is important to you. You want to do it in an optimized way. And you frankly got other things to worry about than if your carpets are cleaned and, oh, I got to call the guy back and blah, 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 blah. So let's just agree right up front that we'll come every six months. We'll call you in advance to make an arrangement, but we'll assume you want us there unless you tell yeah. us to stop. And that takes a huge load off of your customer. Uh, it allows them to move on and worry about other things, knowing that their carpets are clean. And, and, and if that... If you can use that psychological tenet of, of trying to take something off your customer's to-do list, yeah. I think you'll find that you'll get a receptive audience in many, many cases to this notion of signing up for a recurring cadence. I mean, what we live in the North, both you and I, you're in Chicago, I'm in Toronto. So we're getting to, to you know, snow season, right? Where we have to have snow tires on our cars, at least we do in Toronto. So my wife- I'm depressing the James. You're depressing, right? depressing, depressing me, You're depressing me with the cold is coming. <laughs> so I, 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 my, my wife and I were having breakfast the other day, and I said, "Oh, what are you doing?" And she said, oh, I've, "I almost forgot. I've got to get the the tires changed out on the car, so I've got to, you know, like 
reserve the company that comes and does it, blah, blah, blah. And she's reserving like three weeks in advance. And this is kind of a stressful thing, right? To, to remember, because if you, the snow falls and then we're, we, we're kind of caught out. And, and it occurred to me at that moment, like, why on earth don't these guys have a subscription model, right? Like it would be so much better for everybody in our family to know that on the 15th of November, there's a little truck that shows up outside our house to come change the tires. Like, I would love that. <laughs> and it would take a, like a load off my wife to worry about having to kind of organize it. Because that's one of the things that falls to her for whatever reason. Anyways, long story short, for a lot of your customers, I think it is actually preferable yeah. to give them a subscription. And it's one of the nine subscription models we write about in, in the other customer. It's a huge convenience. And I have, you know, I've been on the phone with companies. I basically am like, can you please just charge me regularly? Because I <laughs> don't want to have to deal with this. And they were shocked, right? It's, people think the opposite. Well, I don't want to feel like people they're locking people in yeah. or charging, but it is a convenience from someone who doesn't want to have to think about it. And, and anyone who knows whatever, the Carpet Cleaning Association of America, John just spit out some amazing, uh, he could give a talk at the, whatever association, whatever you just said, they could use <laughs> that all sales the sexy pitch. Talks. Yeah. They could use I that sales pitch. Really, yeah. What's that? The carpet Cleaners of America. That's, that's yeah, how I want to I don't spend. know. Some association out there, you could have used that pitch of like, you're going to get sick. Your kids are going to get sick. They're going to miss school. So that was a great speech. The um, other, yeah, the other thing that before we leave, Michael, the other thing that I really thought he did a great job of, and again, this sounds like the legal episode of Built to Sell. It's, it's not intended that way. And again, I'm not a lawyer, so seek the advice of one. But he does really nice job of talking about the difference between a shotgun agreement and an operating agreement. And, and I think those two things are different, right? The shotgun agreement is a legal clause that's triggered when you're at a point where you wanna buy out or be bought out. Whereas an operating agreement is, is, is an agreement between partners that says like, here's how we're gonna kind of approach this business. Here's kind of roughly what we're gonna spend on marketing. Here's roughly what we're gonna take in salaries. Here's the kinds of ways we're gonna make decisions. Here are our priorities, et cetera. And so that's, different. It may include a shotgun clause as part of an operating agreement, but it, the, the two things are, are, are not the same thing. And so really, if you're going into a partnership, you want both a, 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 an operating agreement that, that governs sort of how you're going to approach the business. But then also, uh, if, if the situation arises where you do need to break up under which conditions that gets done is important to address as well. So <clears throat> question um, from Susan. Um, she said net promoter score was mentioned, um, mm -hmm. in this episode. Um, what is that and how should I use that in my business? So, yeah, he, he talked a lot about, uh, Michael Kaplan talked a lot about net promoter score. Um, Susan, I would say kind of Google net promoter score because it, there's a lot to it and I don't want to, uh, you know, give it short shift here, but effectively it's a way to measure customer satisfaction developed by a guy named Fred Reicheld. And, and what's unique about net promoter score is it's predictive. Uh, most customer satisfaction surveys are not predictive. They're not necessarily correlated to what will happen in the future. Whereas net promoter score is predictive. It's predictive of the growth rate of your company. So the higher the net promoter score you have, the more likely you are to grow at a rate faster than the economy. Average net promoter score is 15%. So if you've got a net promoter score higher than that, it means that you're likely to grow at a rate faster than the economy is growing. Uh, I think uh, world-class is 50, 5, 0, unless that's changed. Um, I think in Kaplan's case, he was sort of in the 70s. So like, obviously doing a lot right and he tied you know his employees compensation or variable compensation to the net promoter score they earn which has some downsides but it's it, it just goes to show how sort of seriously he took net promoter score as a way to measure number one the satisfaction of his customers but also predict the future growth rate of his company yeah so, i thought it was interesting I, too but, when you mentioned that from the episode I think they did some kind of bonusing to employees based on yeah. net promoter score. And you even asked something about how do you uh, make sure that they don't game the system? 
<laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. That's really the downside of of yeah. tying employee compensation to net promoter score is, and we've all been the recipients of these phone calls where, you know, you'll be t dealing with a customer service agent and they say, oh, my boss is going to send you an email in a couple of hours. Can you just give me a 10? Because it like drives my bonus. And then you feel this moral obligation <laughs> because you're like, oh man, I don't want to like totally mess up this person's like variable compensation. Yeah. They were fine. And so you, you, you end up completely getting people trying to game and having these sort of ridiculous net promoter scores that are clearly not tenable. So that's the problem and the downside with, with tying employee compensation to NPS is, is employees will find a way to try to game it. And, yeah. uh, and then you're kind of creating this awkward relationship with your customers where they, you know, they don't want to, they, they want to give you frank feedback at the same time. They don't want to, you know, un throw a particular employee under the bus. So it, yeah, it, it can get messy. So I would, if you, it, I would encourage you not to tie uh, employee comp to net promoter score. I think there's other things you can use net promoter score for, but I think uh, tying employee comp can be mm -hmm. can be dangerous, especially employees who are frontline workers where they have direct relationships with the customers. That can be a bit sketchy. So the next uh, was with Paul Farrell who built a security company, a security software company that helped organizations understand and calculate the risks associated with a cyber attack, okay? In two years, he grew it to around $1.2 million in annual recurring revenue. Um, and, you know, the sales cycles are is high in that business. And he could trade for eight to you know, 10 times revenue. So as his financing kind of fell away, him and his wife were covering the company's burn rate personally. And COVID hit, uh, the sales cycle kind of went to a halt and it became obviously more uncomfortable funding the, the burn rate. And so he decided to sell. Um, and, you know, there was a lot to dig into. I think he met the person at a conference. Uh, he's like spoke with them and basically made it uh, available you know, or open that he was selling and they came up to him. Uh, afterwards. So what did you find interesting with Paul's story? Yeah, it was it was neat. You know, as you just described his exit, it's funny. I it just struck me how how much of a range there is based on the, the kind of company you have when you go to sell. So Justin Adams, this sort of high growth, very highly unique SaaS company, software service company, you know, thought he was he could, he could get as much as 15 times revenue for his company. Then the very next story is Michael Kaplan, who sold not for four times revenue, but four times EBITDA, right? And then the next story is is Paul looking at, oh, it's probably eight to ten times revenue, which is, again, like an, again for folks listening, I, you know, I, I want people to understand that, that you know, the, these revenues of, like multiples of revenue are really, really rare and and very much the uh, the kind of the world of SaaS companies growing fast, et cetera. And so I don't want folks to listen to this and think, oh, I could get 10 times revenue for my carpet cleaning company or something. Like it's just, you know, these SaaS companies are really valued at, at, at completely different multiples. So that just was one thing that kind of occurred to me as I was just listening to your introduction. The other thing, um, you know that that really struck me about Paul's interview was the 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 difference between a professional CEO which I would I would say Paul is and a bootstrap founder you know one of the things I do usually when I do an interview is I'll go to the individual's LinkedIn profile just to see kind of what else they've done and just basically doing my due diligence and my research. And in Paul's case, I was really quite taken aback by what he accomplished in his life. So he, he kind of rose up as a, I think he was a senior vice president at AOL before Steve Case sold it to Tom Warner. I mean, like this goes back a couple of you know decades, but he clearly had achieved a very, very high level in a massive company and then went on to be the CEO of a number of other businesses and Nehemiah was his latest. And it was funded not by him personally, but by a family office that he's worked with and done lots of deals with. And he, you know, if I 
am paraphrasing. These are these are my words, not his. So he he might take issue with this, but my sense was that he's kind of parachuted into these companies to to build them uh, over a couple of years, and then and then you know sell them generally. And it's it, you know it's just it was just really striking to me having interviewed so many bootstrap founders who are kind of sleeves rolled up up you know. Uh, very, very entrepreneurial to, in contrast, Paul was much more of a, what I would characterize as a, as a CEO. And, and there were some, just some differences in his demeanor, differences in his language. He was even quite guarded about, you know, just sharing some of the, the kind of basic stuff we almost always talk about, like what, you know, what was the multiple, did you have an earn out? Like, he was very careful, like most CEOs would be, right, about being too revealing on an interview, right? Whereas most entrepreneurs I interview don't do a lot of media. They're not sort of, they haven't gotten super polished answers to all the stuff, which is part of the reason I enjoy interviewing them is because it's a little bit more raw. Whereas Paul's interview is a bit more polished and a bit more like, you know, uh, a bit more like a CEO. And I, I think that was a, that's a contrast from the, from the typical episodes that, uh, that I do. Um, John Michael asks, and by the way, you can put any questions in the chat. <clears throat> if you're thinking of selling, how open do you want to be about it? And maybe he's mm -hmm. asking that because, I mean, if Paul's speaking on a stage and then I, I don't remember <clears throat> if he said in the talk that he was thinking of selling a company or how that, that other speaker found out about it, but it seemed like he was being pretty open about it. So anyways, Michael asks about how open should yeah. you be? When selling, yeah, yeah. Well, on the episode, I, 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 uh, I told the story of James Murphy because I was trying to get Paul to, to, to sort of reveal a little bit more about his approach because there was some secret sauce in what Nehemiah did. This was this IT uh, company that helped people quantify their cyber attack risk or whatever. There was a, you know, there's, there's some data models. There's some, there's some, there's a black box behind the, the algorithm, and so I wanted to get him to talk a little bit about how. Uh, how he approached that, the secrecy of of that data with acquirers, because of course, when you go to sell your business, you're going to want to keep a lot of that stuff close to your vest. At the same time, the acquirer is going to want to know all that stuff as they're doing their due diligence. The question is like, what do you do? And I told the story of James Murphy, just paraphrasing, James Murphy built Viviscal, which is hair loss treatment for women who lose their hair for generally hormonal reasons. And he developed a marine protein, which is very effective against women's hair loss. And he got Reese Witherspoon to endorse it. And, and it, it was a, a very successful product. Um, he built it up to, I think, 50, 50, 45 million euros in revenue based in Ireland and went to sell it and went through a whole process of pitching the business to consumer packaged goods companies, Procter & Gamble, Warner, Lambert, et cetera. And he went through and got lots of offers, was going through the due diligence process with all of these different acquirers. Finally, he reached an agreement with C&D, uh, Church and Dwight, they, they own Trojan Condoms and a bunch of other consumer packaged goods products. And I asked him in the interview, I said, like, did you tell him how the product is made? Like, it's this marine protein. I mean, did you give him the formula? And he's like... No, I didn't give them the formula until the check cleared my bank account. Wow. I was like, hey, but how did they know they were buying something legit? And, and he said, well, they just had to trust me. Like I wasn't going to share the secret formula until the check cleared the bank account. And I shared that story with Paul and, and he was a bit more forthcoming. He said, look, you know, a recipe in one person's hands is doesn't always render the same uh, dish as the same recipe in another person's hands, meaning there's executional risk and you've got to know how to execute. And so he was more comfortable with it. But but uh, but James Murphy of Viviscal was uh, was pretty uh, guarded with That's his, pretty bold. Uh, his trade secrets. Yeah, I can. I mean, you you so. talk about this, and we'll get into <clears throat> the Mahal shit uh, sheet episode. But you also you know asked him while the other company was doing due diligence, was he worried? about um, them, you know, I don't know, not necessarily stealing, stealing customers, yeah. but like, you know, gaining an advantage because they are basically yeah. digging into every last thing about your books and your company. 
Yeah, and, and I asked him specifically about you know employees leaving, right? Which is oftentimes a real risk of a, an extrapolated long. Uh, due diligence phase, right? Where employees start to learn you're selling the company. If diligence lasts, you know, three months, four months, five months, employees are like, this is going to be ter- terrible. They, you know, touch up their LinkedIn resume and they shop their, you know, their services. And it can, it can really down, be a downfall for a lot of deals. So it's another reason to go back to Justin Adams. You want to keep your due diligence to a finite amount of time and hold the acquired to that because, you know, you've, you, it's got to be surgical. You, you can't let this thing drag on for months and months and months because employees will start to leave. And uh, I did ask Paul about that. He 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 felt that that he was a yeah. You know, he he's definitely done this before, so felt comfortable the way he approached yeah. it. The next episode, uh, Mahal Sheath uh, started VMS Aircraft in '95 with a plan to sell spare parts to airlines. He had uh, he invested I think twenty five thousand in inventory to get him off to get him off the ground and uh in 2016 he um it was eight million dollars in revenue um and he had some of the largest airlines as customers he was hoping to get six to eight times ebitda for his business um and i think when he appro- was approached by a french company he was like yeah i'm looking for eight obviously it was good that he didn't say the range for, because he's probably like, oh you want six to eight yeah we'll give you six um but exactly i thought that's what, when you asked him that question what did you say I thought he was good. I was like, oh, what? Did, I think he said about eight times or something like that. So he did not give a range, which was probably smart. But um, he, um, you know, created this recurring revenue stream through the service contracts. What was um, he, you know, really had to button up his standard operating procedures. There was a bunch of conversation around that because I think in the interview he said if they label one thing wrong, it could be like boom, twenty five thousand dollar fine or whatever it is. So. I'd love to hear what you thought was interesting about uh, VMS aircraft. Gosh, a, a ton. This was a really, a really cool interview for me because because Mahul is a a fairly understated guy, and I wasn't sure what to expect, but he was a, a real gem and and had a ton of value. Um, you mentioned standard operating procedures. That's something that is is something we talk a lot about, and uh, he had put some in place. Because again, if the FAA were to find out that he was that his employees were doing storing a product in the wrong way or treating a, you know a, you know rivets in the wrong way, like it, they would be fined many thousands of dollars. And so it was important employees follow the process and the system. And that was one of the ways he got out of doing the doing himself to you know to to train his people on SOPs. It wasn't for me the most interesting piece. For me, the most interesting piece was what a lot of founders, I think, right now uh, are coming to grips with. And that is that being the local provider uh, of any product or service, whether that's retailing a local, you know, the, being the local you know, shoe store or being the local retailer of a certain product, or even the regional distributor, which is what Mayhill found himself in as a distributor of products, being a local guy or gal has lost its, if it ever was an advantage, it's really become almost obsolete, right? When, when you think about Amazon, it, it's the everything store. You can get virtually anything now overnight. And Amazon has revolutionized our expectations of everything, right? So it's not just Amazon, it's virtually every product that we now would conceive of buying, we can buy direct to consumer. And so this 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 idea of well, I'm the local provider. I've got a you know a, a piece of territory here, and I distribute this plumbing part in these three states. Like that, if it hasn't basically gone away as a point of advantage, it will, and it is. And I think what 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 Mehul found was it was it was very much a diluted value proposition very quickly, right? Because he was working with all these airlines, Southwest Airlines, United, et cetera, and they would need widgets. Uh, they, let's use a more realistic example, not a fake example. They would use, they would need rivets in order to repair a seal in the fuselage of an airplane, right? And you can get those rivets from Mayhill's company, but there's increasingly dozens of other companies that could sell you the same rivets, right? And they'll ship them to you overnight. And and so there's really no comparative advantage. And so what do you do? Well, you just basically 
compete on price, that's a recipe for uh, undermining the value of your company and ultimately going bankrupt. And so what did Mayhul do? Well, he looked at it and he said, okay, how do I add value? How do I become a differentiated offering to supply all these parts? And so he did a number of different things. One thing he did is he built out a clean room. And a clean room is a room where there is no or little dust. And you might say, well, why on earth would he do that? Well, if you are responsible for keeping airplanes in the air and you literally have people's lives in your hands, how the metal that goes and wraps the fuselage of an airplane gets treated is actually really important. And if there's dust buildup around the seams of those metal uh, sheets, you could conceivably have an unclean seal, which could lead to a failure. And you could see how having a clean room would be an important differentiator. He did dry ice, uh, you know, for things that, in, you know, solvents and sealants that needed to be kept at a certain temperature. He had a dry ice whole kind of distribution thing going where he kept things at a certain temperature. He repackaged certain items that came in like giant, you know, industrial sized tubs which no airline would need, you know, like imagine a, a repair sealant, uh, you know, repair the, the seam on, on, a, on a piece of metal. You might only use a few ounces of it a year. Instead of buying like a 60 pound tub of the thing, he would create these little containers for these airlines who only needed it a little bit, all the while creating a differentiated point of advantage, right? So he could turn around and say, no, no, you're not just buying the, you know, the rivets from me. You're buying the rivets that have been kept at a certain temperature that have been in a clean room so there's no dust. And all the while making his point of differentiated that much more strong. He went from gross margins in the kind of low 20% uh, rain gross profit margins in the low 20% range when he was just kind of reselling other people's stuff to when he sold the business, he was in the 60 to 70% gross margin. And a company much larger than his, a big French company that wanted a, ge a geographical footprint in the United States came along. And one of the conversations they would have had is like, should we buy Mayhill's company or should we just compete with them? I mean, there's nothing magic about you know selling rivets to Southwest Airlines. They decided to buy his business and pay seven and a half times EBITDA for it, not because he sold rivets, but because he had the clean room and he had the dust free and he had the point of advantage and he was getting 60% margins in selling to these airlines. And again, I'm, I'm getting animated just talking about it, but the, the idea of that your business is unique because you have a geographical swath of land that you're selling to, if it hasn't become obsolete yet, it will. And, and so I think getting ahead of it and developing, as Mihul did, a, a point of differentiation that is not just the local guy or gal, I think really sets you up to, to have a great exit. John, I mean, you pretty much just answered what the next question was by Will, but he said, how do you increase margins in a commoditized world? Yeah. And you, you pretty so much just Mihul answered did, yeah. that ahead of time. So, yeah. 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 Um, I mean, just, the differentiation. I yeah, you're you're looking to find something. I mean, you you need something customers care about, number one, right? And 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 something that makes you different, right? That's the, the kind of definition of a marketing strategy, right? Something people care about and something that makes you different. And you can't just have one of those variables, right? You can't just decide, okay, well, we're gonna be different because our trucks are gonna be pink. Well, it's great. That's going to make your truck stand out on the road. They're gonna be pink. That's awesome. But if you ask your customers, do you care what color the trucks are? Probably the answer is no. They care that you're there on time, that you offer a great service, blah, blah, blah. So equally, if you were to pick something that is really important to customers, let's say you're a carpet cleaning company and you show up on time, right? You show up, if you say, I'm going to be there at nine, you show up at nine. And that's your point of differentiation. Well, that may be important to customers, but if there's three other carpet cleaning companies that say they're punctual, it's not differentiating. So actually finding something, and this would be my answer to Will's question, that is both differentiating as well as important to your customers can actually be, it can actually be very hard. I think Mehul did a great job uh, because he really listened to his customers and found out that they'd be willing to pay a premium for a company that stored products in a clean room and not just a dusty warehouse. 
he would be willing to pay a premium if they keep solvents at a stable temperature and not letting them get really hot or really cold, hence the dry ice, et cetera. So he figured out ways to differentiating himself that also were important to customers. And so that's the two, that, those are the two criteria I think you're looking for, Will. Great question. I think, you know, John, I thought what was different about this interview from others is a lot of interviews the founder is on and once they sell, they're like, okay, they're itching to leave or do something else. It seemed like he stayed on for a long time afterwards. I don't yeah. know if, you true. know, he commented or on, I don't remember if he had mentioned that, but maybe talk about that dynamic of once selling what is typical, but for him, was there was there something that he mentioned that why, I think, I don't remember if he said, oh yeah, I'm in year four afterwards or, or something. You, you'd been there for a while already. Yeah, I mean, look, look, clearly having an earnout is one reason people stay. You talked about golden handcuffs earlier, but when an earnout obviously is where you put a, a tranche of proceeds at risk and you've got to hit a certain target in order to get that second or third payment. And so that's going to keep a lot of entrepreneurs sort of at a company, regardless of whether they're enjoying that or not. And I think it comes down to, you know, we, we talk a lot about at Value Builder, this, this idea that there are three types of entrepreneurs. They're called mountain climbers, freedom fighters, and craftspeople. And mountain climbers are motivated by growth and achievement. Cra uh, freedom fighters are motivated by independence. Craftspeople are motivated by mastery. And, you know, I think in a funny way, uh, mountain climbers may actually be more inclined to stay with a company, in particular if they are incentivized to do so and they are enabled with a budget to achieve something great. So there's lots of examples. No one's coming to mind out of the top of my head of people who sell uh, to a private equity group, but they keep 40% of their equity and they and they just enjoy the process of really yeah. achieving something big and We're part of something bigger at that point. Yeah. 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 Whereas freedom fighters uh, psychologically are just allergic to. They're gone. <laughs> they're yeah, gone. No, they're just, they just uh, can't stand the idea of being judged and being controlled. Right. Yeah. No. I, so, totally. yeah. I have and friends, so, they sold their company in the past year. And what I, you know, that breakdown makes perfect sense. I'm like, oh, when you said that one of them is a mountain climber for sure, they're excited. They're going to stay. They want to build, be a part of a big organization. One of them's a freedom fighter. They're like, I can't get out of this fast enough. So I yeah. totally hear you. What, what about the crafts? Uh, wh where do they fall in typically staying yeah, or not staying? Is yeah, they're motivated by mastery, right? So they are, they're typically not bought and sold. They are, they're massage therapists, they're copywriters, they're photographers. Those businesses generally just close down when they, when they're, you know, when, when the, the owner wants to retire, they're self-employed individuals effectively. So they're, they're not really uh, companies that, that are bought and sold in a, in a traditional way. Is there something else to, for a founder to think about, like you mentioned the earn out when, if they are, you know, going to stay on for an extended period of time or not, what else should they be thinking about on that um, end of the deal of what they should be talking to that purchasing company about? Yeah, you know, you've really got to ensure, do the best possible job you can to ensure that you can hit your earn out, you can control that. So, you know, I, I'm reminded of of two stories, Built Cell Radio stories. Um, one, what Rod Drury, who sold a company called Aftermail before he started Zero, uh, the, you know, the, the papers trumpeted it as a $35 million acquisition. Realistically, it was a $15 million acquisition with a $20 million earn out. Rod celebrated and the sale and then kind of got back to work and, and realized he had missed his window and, 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 and never hit the earnout. So kind of walked away nine months later with, with nothing more than his downstroke, the original amount of, of payment that he received. Um, another, because his earnout was tied to earnings and it was very difficult for him to achieve that without really influencing the sales team of the company that bought him. And, and he'd lost that kind of window. And the way most own earnouts are work is budget is freed up based on you hitting milestones. And so if you start missing milestones, they start shutting down budget. And as soon as if your 
your top line focus is you, you can't hit your your goal. So I would always try to encourage founders to try to tie it to something they control. Revenue is usually easier to control than profits because profits can be in, interpreted and can be subjective. Revenue is much more objective. Um, I'm even reminded of an even better example, Rob Walling, who does a great podcast called Startups for the Rest of Us. Uh, Tiny Seed is an investor and also uh, does microconf. He got into all that by selling a company called Drip. Drip was a, a email marketing software, and I interviewed him after the fact. And he said, "Yeah, there was an earnout." He said, "Look," I said, "Like," and they first they they wanted to tie it to EBITDA, and then they wanted to tie it to revenue. And I'm like, "I'm not signing up for any of that." And what he agreed to was to have his earnout signed up for, signed, tied to the release of a new product feature. And Rob, being a, a techie guy, you know, technical founder, he knew that he could control the release of that launch. He knew he they start releasing off. features every day. Like, no, I'm just What's kidding. that? <laughs> they start releasing features every day. Yeah, we can release features all day long. Yeah, you want to release features? Control it. Was, yeah. it was a certain feature that, that, yeah. that, lead pages wanted as part of drip and they said all right it wasn't developed yet and so rob said look time i earn out to me releasing this feature they were successful in launching the feature he got his earn out and it was just a, a creative way to agree to an earn out but still control your own destiny so if you're not a technical founder clearly that's not going to be the right way to tie your earn out but you're really looking for something that you feel like you can control to the best of your ability what I love about these interviews, and everyone go to builttocell.com slash radio, is such a variety of businesses. So, so go back and listen. It's like you have a carpet cleaning business, you have something in cybersecurity, you have someone serving the aircraft. And, you know, innovation comes from outside industry, I feel, you know, gaining insight. So um, I love the variety of the interviews. I'm glad you said that, Jeremy, because I agree 100%. I think if you're just looking at your competitors, then you're just living in a vacuum. And and, and the real incredible examples of, of companies, and probably Brian Scudamore is is the legendary example of this. Brian Scudamore, the founder of Wayne Hunter, got junk along with Wow One Day Painting. And it's just an epic, epic entrepreneur. He is famous for studying outside industry. So one example of that is when he really wanted to learn uh, about how to grow 1-800-GOT-JUNK into a, into a national, you know, an international franchiser. He went to FedEx and asked them to teach him about logistics. Like, talk about going to the source, right? Like he, he went to a courier company, had nothing to do with like junk removal and said, I want to learn about logistics, right? Because part, part of junk removal has, you know, you're picking up people's junk, then you're selling it on. And so there's a logistical component to it. And it's, you know, instead of just looking at the junk industry and finding out how competitors were doing, he's like, no, I'm going to go to FedEx and I'm going to ask to see someone in their logistics group. And, they, and to his credit, he, he got time with people in the logistics department of FedEx and you know the rest is history. He built an incredible business. I love it. John, uh, it's always a pleasure. Where else should we point people online to check out more, learn more? I know we mentioned Built to Sell and builttosell.com uh, slash radio. Where else should we point people? Yeah, I think that's great. I think... Um, builttocell.com slash SOP, you can download the free ebook we just wrote on standard operating procedures, how to create them. And, and that was a big part of Michael Kaplan's success is, and, and for that matter, maybe whole Seth. So uh, builttocell.com slash SOP is a place you can get that. It's free. And all the stories are always at builttocell.com. So, uh, so check it out. Awesome. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dr. J. It was fun. Hey, if you like today's episode, you're going to love my new book, The Art of Selling Your Business. The book was inspired by the cohort of my guests over the years who have been able to negotiate an exit far better than the benchmark in their industry, sometimes two or three times more than I would have expected. I was curious to understand the tactics and strategies of these entrepreneurs and what they do differently from average performers. The result is a playbook for punching above your weight when it comes to selling your business. To learn more, go to builttosell.com slash selling, where we put together a collection of gifts for listeners who order the book. Just go to builttosell.com slash selling. Built to Sell Radio is produced by Haley Parkhill. 
Our audio and video engineer is Dennis Labataglia. If you like what you've just heard, subscribe to get a new episode delivered to your inbox each week. Just go to builttosell.com. Thanks for listening to Built to Sell Radio with John Warlow. For complete show notes with links to additional resources, visit builttosell.com slash blog. John is the founder of the Value Builder System. To find out how to improve the value of your business by 71%, visit valuebuildersystem.com. John is also the author of Built to Sell, creating a business that can thrive without you and the automatic customer, creating a subscription business in any industry. Connect with John at facebook.com slash built to sell or on Twitter at John Warlow, W-A-R-R-I-L-L-O-W. Thanks for listening.